Uh, session three, Renaissance Eclecticism, Plato, Magic, and Memory. As I pointed out in the beginning, this is, uh, will probably be the strangest set of topics that we cover. Uh, last time we did the uh, sort of the standard heartland of discussing humanism, the devotion to text and the discovery of text and the invention of humanistic studies. But this time we're gonna get into the more marginal issues and which is why I call it eclecticism. And we'll go to the first slide and a little background first of all. In the Middle Ages, scholastic philosophy was dominated by Aristotle from the ancient world, but not Aristotle directly. It was Aristotle as translated from the Arab texts. And remember, I pointed out last time how these texts were, um, went through stages of double translation. They went through interim uh, steps to get into Arabic, and they went through interim translations to get into Latin when they were brought back to Europe. So they were fairly corrupted. What could not be accounted for uh, within standard philosophy, that is uh, what would have been called revelation, the sacred text, as revealed by uh, the God in question, was filtered through St. Augustine largely in the ancient world. By the time we get to our period, Augustine's version of Christianity was nearly a thousand years old. And it was a synthesis of Plato, Platonic philosophy, and Christian theology. And, and we're gonna turn to Plato very soon in here. Characteristic of medieval philosophy which was incredibly uh, creative. It was systematic. It asked the big questions. It was metaphysical. And, and they produced these grand theories of everything. Uh, Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica, uh, Moses Maimonides in his Guide for the Perplex. These were attempts at synthesizing everything that could be known into one grand consistent theory. The humanists uh, largely responded with eclectic tendencies. They basically, they were, they were very tech centric. They basically picked up pieces and bits from lots of different intellectual traditions and piece them back together again, uh, variously. So they had a mastery of ancient languages, as I point out in the slide here. Uh, and they demonstrated the inadequacies of the received translations so that there was this attempt at getting back to originals, uh, classical Latin and Greek originals, Hebrew originals, Arabic originals. So they, they became uh, technically incredibly adept. Humanist classicism finds the medieval mindset narrow and constrained, restricted just to large philosophical positions and questions. The secular cast of the Roman sources that we've been talking about for the first couple of sessions was a, uh, a new catalyst to inquiry, but inquiry of a different kind. So the expansion of available source material through this linguistic revolution uh, includes an extensive range of classical thought, not limited just to philosophical forefathers. So huge doses of Neoplatonism, huge doses of various Hellenistic philosophy, meaning philosophy that was developed in uh, the ancient world between the Greek heyday and the Roman heyday, overlapping with the Roman. 
it was largely a tradition of, in, in uh, the Greek speaking world, but the Romans uh, adapted to it with, with real appetite. So we have this explosion of philosophical systems, Stoicism, Epicureanism, skepticism, cynicism. Uh, and re remember the painting of Raphael, the School of Athens with all the philosophers stretched out over the, the steps of the school. Each one of those would have been known to the Renaissance world as one of these figures. It would have been Epicurus or it would have been Zeno or Diogenes the Cynic. Various mystical and occult traditions get picked up from the ancient world. So Gnosticism, a, a uh, heretical and aberrant form of Christianity that develops in the first and second centuries with secret wisdom, the, the, the gnosos, the knowledge. Hermeticism, which I'm going to start talking about in a few minutes, uh, developing from this uh, legendary figure, Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes, the, the three-time master, the thrice master. Uh, Kabbalah, which is a Jewish mystical tradition, but gets picked up by Renaissance humanist Christians who develop a, a version of a Christian Kabbalah. Traditions of magic, astrology, alchemy, all of this gets thrown into a giant pot. So you're going to get figures, as, as we're going to see later, like uh, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, who is an adept in all of these traditions and puts them together in this incredible melange of uh, an intellectual stew, if you will, one, one big ratatouille of thought picked up from the ancient world. And as I say in the box at the bottom of this slide, humanist thought is critical and historical in spirit. It rarely rises to the level of a grand system. It does on occasion, and I'll mention that along the way, but very rarely do you think of humanists as uh, philosophers worth studying going forward. So here in the 21st century, uh, practically no figure from uh, the Renaissance jumps out, except for maybe Machiavelli in, in political theory, but very rarely does one jump out as a figure that needs to be studied the way other periods of thought in the West, the way the Middle Ages, for instance, produce several people that moderns still turn to from Aquinas and Maimonides to people like William of Ockham and, and, and Bonaventure, uh, the, the Oxford Franciscan movement. Uh, but in our period, no. So the universal man, which was the goal of Renaissance education, this uomo universale, may have been a polymath, but from another angle, uh, you might argue that he's a bit of a dilettante or a dabbler. And, and if there ever is a frontal attack leveled at the humanists, it's that they don't produce uh, the deepest thinkers, but they certainly produce in many ways uh, the most inventive, the most uh, fluent linguistic experts heretofore in philosophy. So on this slide, we're going to spend a little time on this slide because this is going to take a bit of explanation. I, I focused on Platonism in the figure of Marsilio Ficino, who, by the way, is probably the only thinker from the period uh, that arguably presented a systematic framework. And he's by, and is same Ficino who authored that uh, work on magic and, and astrology that I had you look at if you had an opportunity in the PDF that I sent. He's a priest, 
He's a client of the great uh, Cosimo de' Medici. He's a teacher of Lorenzo, Il Magnifico, Lorenzo the Magnificent. Uh, so he's, he's at the, the very nexus of power in the Quattrocento, the 15th century. He translates Plato into Latin. He's learned his Greek very well. He's, he's followed the Florentine tradition ever since Chris Aloris had, had been invited to Florence by, by uh, Salutati of, of learning his Greek very well. He translates all of Plato into Latin, all the Platonic texts that they could get in manuscript form. And he adopts Plato's theory of forms and the immortality of the soul. At this point, in this little top box, I'd like to do a, a very quick overview because it's very significant for what we will be talking about for the rest of this session of, of Plato and how he appealed to these people. Uh, so Plato, who's obviously one of the great seminal figures in, in Greek philosophy, argued that fundamental reality, the really real, as some people would try to put it, was abstract, eternal, and unchanging. It was the realm of forms or ideas, sometimes called paradigma, uh, paradigms, idoi, uh, ideas. These ideas, an example of which would be number, for instance, as, as Plato will ask in one of his dialogues, um, how many number twos are there? Well, there's only one two. There is two-ness. There's the abstract concept of two, which he wants to argue is more real than the physical objects observable in the sensory world that you would apply the concept to. So you could hold up two books uh, to the child and say, ah, you see, two. But really, you're pointing at an abstraction that is purely conceptual, and as Plato would argue, is prior to the physical world. It's more important than the physical world. Objects in the physical world are mere copies. He says, you understand the idea dog, and you have seen thousands of dogs, but none of the actual dogs in the physical world that you've seen is the essential meaning dog. They are just, as he would argue, uh, pale copies, imperfect changing copies. Dogs in the physical world are born and they die. The idea dog is indestructible, it's abstract, and it doesn't change. So as I say in, in the middle of this paragraph, the material world of sense data, on the other hand, is a realm of imperfect, constantly changing copies. And the act of learning, the act of learning, the soul remembers these eternal ideas. So he does this, Plato does this in a couple of his dialogues where he makes the case that you point at things as you educate the child. You say, ah, here are two books, here are two dogs, here are two pencils, but you can't point at the idea too. They have to make a leap. You can lead them to the point of triggering the understanding of the idea, but the understanding is an aha moment. They finally make the leap. Oh, I get it. It's this concept that applies to these physical things. It isn't the physical things themselves. And, and Plato wants to argue that since the idea of dog and the idea of two and the idea of good and the idea of justice 
and all his other ideas are eternal, unchanging, and objective. They're the same for you as they are for me. And that you can't see them in the world. He wants to make the case, well, they must be remembered then from like a previous consciousness. Nobody can put the idea justice into your, into your mind. And therefore, the idea has to be remembered uh, from before. The only way you could have gotten to it is if it were implanted there. This, by the way, in modern philosophical thinking, is not entirely removed from like Chomsky's uh, theory of linguistics, where the idea that language is innately uh, wired and ideas in that sense are innately wired into the brain. But for Plato, do, the fact that you can remember things that are immortal proves that the soul is immortal. Okay? So he wants to suggest that there is a physical world and there is this higher abstract world. And then he goes on to argue that beyond that, abstract world is a, a mysterious, ineffable world uh, that he refers to simply as uh, the good. And I am going to very quickly bounce us over. screen. Do you remember if you ever had a chance uh, back in college to read a little Plato, somebody introduced you to the allegory of the cave. And I found nothing but miserable visualizations of it on the web. So, but this I thought might give us an idea of it. Basically, Plato in the allegory says, we are these guys down, oh, let me get my pointer. Let us annotate with a pointer. Okay. We're these guys down here. Okay. And all we look at is the physical world. And this physical world are these shadows on the wall. And the shadows flicker and they change and they disappear. And, and they get distorted the way shadows always get distorted. And how they're made is that there are these puppeteers, if you will, walking between a light source and we who are locked into position looking at that wall. And they, they are bringing objects that don't change. So here is a statue of a horse. And, and allegorically, it would be there'd be the concept of justice or the, or, or the concept of mathematical concept of equality. And the light would cast shadows from this horse onto the wall. And as the puppeteers moved, or as we moved our eyeballs, left to right, whatever, the shadows would flicker and change in dimension. And so all we get through a glass darkly are these um, changing vague images of reality. And that uh, the source of reality is, is this fire uh, which, which causes the forms to be perceived in the physical world. And this would be in, in, in Plato's universe, um, in effect, the good. But what he's really suggesting in the allegory is that you could get out of the cave if you could liberate yourself and enter a world of the real light source, which would be the sun, and, and see the world through the eyes of philosophy 
as uh, unfettered, if you will. Looking at, okay, so we're back. So Pacino, by adopting Platonism, is already pointed to a world that is conceptual and internal and not obvious to sense data as a, the fundamentally real world. He also, lower half of the slide, he also translates uh, another Greek from the Roman world, uh, Plotinus, his Enneads into Latin. And he revives Roman and Hellenistic Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism was an effort uh, by Plotinus and, and, and toyed with by people like St. Augustine, was an attempt to see if you could bridge, I say it down here in the box, the great divide in Plato between the immaterial and material world. There were people in the ancient world who were not satisfied with this platonic focus on the conceptual world, wanting to understand how uh, the physical world is related to it. Is it just chimerical? Is it, is, is it just this veil of Maya, this, this screen of nothing? Or does it really tie to the immaterial world. And Plotinus, in his attempt to bridge the divide, develops a theory of what they call emanation. So the essential reality, which Plato called the good and with Pl which Plotinus calls the one, it sounds like we're, we're somewhere back in the uh, film, The Matrix, Are You the One, the Tahain, which Christian theologians call God, the absolute reality, the one, emanates through either acts of creation or, which is more the Christian spin on it, the Judeo-Christian spin on it, or, or the uh, Plotinian, version, which is an emanation, something, something that, looking at this diagram on the lower right, emanates down into ever lower forms. So from absolute re reality and emanation down to the, the realm of the forms, the noetic or, or knowledge reality, down to, emanates further down to humans the, and, and their psychic reality emanates down to the physical world. And that all reality has this um, striving to return to the higher source, to transcend its own limited presence in the world up the scale up the ladder and to return ultimately to the absolute real. So there's an, the religious impulse in man to return to higher things, the return from everything. Uh, I'm thinking of the, the French Catholic theologian Teilhard de Chardin, who, who his great book, was called everything that rises must converge as he tries to explain uh, the great chain of being as an attempt for everything to move from the less perfect back up the chain to the more perfect. Now you see what this does, it ties everything in the universe together, not just in, whoops, 
sorry about that, not just in a direction that I would call mystical, but also in a direction that you would suggest is pantheistic. Everything is somehow part of God, or God is part of everything. Everything is connected. To understand the more extreme elements in Renaissance thought, this idea of connectedness of all things is essential. And, and we're going to go into this in depth in, in a couple of slides. But it, a couple of things jump out. One is that what we take as the obviously real, the world of sense data, is not really at the bottom the real. There is, there is a higher, more fundamental, more uh, primitively perfect world which is not obvious, and, and the fact that it is not obvious means that one is going to have to develop secret ways of reading this new text to get back to essential truths. And Ficino, Ficino is in the middle of this development. He's educating people like his student, uh, Pico della Mirandola, in these assumptions which lend themselves very much to, to traditions of mysticism. Okay, we're back to our, our picture of the, um, of the uh, School of Athens. Ficino establishes the Academia Platonica at the court of the Medici, a, a platonic academy. And, and I've, I've given you a larger version of it here. And in, in the fresco, uh, the central figures, I drew a little black box. That's me, not, not Raffaello, around the central figures of Plato on the left and Aristotle on the right. And then these two bullets on the bottom, Aristotle, with his interest in natural science and a theory of knowledge that values sense data, that values significantly, he's the great scientist of the ancient world, the evidence of the sen senses, he's depicted, look at his right arm, he's pointed out, he is, if I, if I can use the, the verb, he is zooming out into the world and Plato, with his interest in formal mathematical ideational reality and, an, and a theory of knowledge and epistemology that distress the evidence of the senses, points up to higher realities. So here are the two engaged in the great discourse. And the rest of the slide, every one of these people is a well-known figure. Diogenes the cynic, lion lying on the steps waiting for Alexander to come across him and say, would you rather be me? And Diogenes says, I'd rather not. Um, these, this entire world, which is suddenly known to them, uh, to the humanists, through all these new translations, has come round to uh, Plato as this emerging uh, central figure. By the way, one of the models for one of the philosophers, I'm not even sure which one, in the fresco is said to be uh, Pico della Mirandola when he was a young man, uh, which would be great if that were possible. Anyhow, let's leap off the deep end now. So the Hermetica. Now this, I've named this slide syncretism, pantheism, and the occult. 
Syncretism is the putting together of elements from different traditions and making a new hodgepodge of the whole thing. The Hermetica is a tradition from the ancient world based on uh, writings that are ascribed to a legendary figure, Hermes Trismegistus, uh, Hermes, the, the, the thrice great, the thrice great master, uh, who is rediscovered uh, by Ficino, and he translates the ancient uh, Greek, Egyptian slash Greek wisdom text. It's a wisdom document, secret wisdom, that, that uh, the Renaissance was obsessed with, based on this cult figure. And, and look at this picture in the um, upper right. This is from a floor panel in the cathedral the Duomo at Siena, and it's Hermes receiving the Magi who have come. May, Magi, by the way, uh, Magi in Latin, Magus is, is the word for magician. They were magicians in the, in the New Testament who come, who are, by the way, following astrologically tracking a new star as they come to Bethlehem to discover the Christ figure. Uh, he's associated Hermes with the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth, a wisdom god. And he's regarded through the medieval and Renaissance periods as a pagan prophet. So there's a vast literature, the Corpus Hermeticum, uh, that ascribes to Hermes uh, early papyri containing spells and initiation uh, ceremonies. I'm going to jump over here. And I'm now looking at that document that I had to take a peek out of that PDF. These are excerpts from the Corpus Hermeticum, which is in Greek, and the Asclepius, the god of healing. Uh, document, which is in Latin, and these are sayings ascribed to Hermes. As above, so below. As within, so without. As the universe, so the soul. Uh, it's got Platonism all over it. If then you do not make yourself equal to God, you cannot apprehend God, for like is known by like. Sounds platonic again. Leap clear of all that is corporeal and make yourself grown to a like expanse with that greatness which is beyond all measure. Rise above all time and become eternal. Then you will apprehend God. Think that for you too, nothing is impossible. Deem that you too are immortal, that you are able to grasp all things in your thought, to know every craft and science. Find your home in the haunts of every living creature. Make yourself higher than all heights and lower than all depths. I, and, and I want to focus yet again to know every craft and science. In, in Goethe's Dr. Faustus, uh, we're told that Faust, er will this was die Welt im Innersten zusammenhält. He wants to know what held the world together below the surface in its deepest, inmost connectedness, which is to know what God knows of the world. But if you shut up your soul and your body and abase yourself and say, I know nothing, I can do nothing, I am afraid of earth and sea, I cannot mount to heaven. I know not what I was nor what I shall be, then what have you to do with God? Man is the most divine of all beings for amongst all living things. Atom associates, the, the Greek Atom Ra, associates with him only, speaking to him in dreams at night, foretelling the future for him in the flight of birds, the bowels of beasts, 
the whispering oak. So ancient augury, ancient augurals, everything is connected. Once you start thinking of the world as an emanation from the essential reality, then everything presents itself as a connected sign, an omen, something, something, to, be, something to be read correctly. Birth is not the beginning of life, only of an individual awareness. Sounds like Plato again. Sounds like Plotinus again. Change into another state is not death, only the ending of this awareness. It sounds like the Buddha. Humanity looked in awe upon the beauty and the everlasting duration of creation. The exquisite sky flooded with sunlight. The majesty of the dark night lit by celestial torches as the holy planetary powers traced their paths in the heavens and fixed in steady meter, ordering the growth of things with their secret infusions. Look at the heavens. There are messages there. Astronomy and astrology were a continuous spectrum. Avoid, and, and very tellingly, avoid all conversation with the multitude or common people for I would not have you subject to envy, much less to be ridiculous unto the multitude. So, we're back. It's a syncretic, Tradition. I'm in, whoops. I'm in the box. Here we go. I got a very lively new mouse here, so it jumps all over the place. It's a syncretic tradition mixing mystery cults, Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, Zoroastrianism from Persia, and the worship of the sun god, Ahura Majda, or Majd, Egyptian traditions of astrology and magic. It was thought to be, and this was a very common in the late medieval and Renaissance period, a prisca theologia, an ancient single true theology that threads through all religions. Suddenly, all religions are merely to be regarded, and this is right out of both Ficino and, and, and Pico, they're to be regarded as cultural expressions of an underlying truer essential religion. So they all have and point back to an or text, a central religiosity. So under the influence of Neoplatonism, all reality is seen as mysteriously interconnected and the special knowledge of initiates is required to harness the power in things. So it's ooh, ee, ooh. We are in the realm of the mystical, and you must be initiated into the secrets, and you just can't allow the ordinary folk uh, access to these things because they will not be prepared to understand it. They will distort it. They won't understand it. They can cause damage. This is why all magical traditions have, have uh, initiation rites and, and periods of study. Uh, a teacher of Ficino and Cosmo de' Medici, a man named Gamistos Plato, uh, who was so much of a Platonist, that's a nickname. Uh, the Plato part. He's a, a Byzantine teacher who comes to teach Greek. He helps found the Platonic Academy. And along the way, a lot of the Egyptian and, and Persian elements, which the Greek world was in very close contact with, uh, he brought with him. So where did Vicino, Vicino get access to some of the the magical texts, the hermetic texts, and the Francis, Zoroastrian texts. There's this mill course on humanism with that guy. Yeah. 
I, I better silence again here. Wait a minute. Um, and whoop, could you silence yourself, please? Here, let me get the shh. Okay, I'm going to mute. I got you muted. Okay. That's okay. So, drives much of the ancient magical Hermetic and Zoroastrian traditions through Gemistos. So he had access to that. Now, some comments on uh, wisdom traditions generally and mystery cults, because they all have uh, certain contours in common. Uh, the the Greco-Roman world, the Egyptian world, the Near Eastern world, were right with mystery cults and traditions. Orphis, I, 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 off the top, without thinking, I listed these eight. There were probably thirty others. Uh, Orphis and Pythagoreanism, Eleusinian mysteries, the Dionysian mysteries, the Kabirian mysteries, the cult of Mithra, the cult of Serapis, the cult of Isis, uh, many of them Bendis, many of them were, were mother gods, fertility goddesses from, from the uh, Near East that were introduced into Hellenistic thinking. Uh, on, the, on the far right, I have, uh, again from the Metropolitan Museum, the Eleusinian reliefs. It's, it's the Eleusinian mysteries was a rebirth cult. Uh, the great mother goddess of fertility and, and grain, you know, the, the rebirth of vegetation, Demeter. Uh, her daughter Persephone on the right is carried to the underworld by Hades and she has to go down into the underworld and bargain with Hades to let her daughter back up. And he says, I'll cut you a deal. I'll let her up from spring, summer, and fall, but then she comes back to me and that'll be winter. And so this cult of rebirth and regeneration and recycling is immortalized in the mysteries, which, which by the way, led to uh, rebirth cults of the soul. So Christianity picks up the Eleusinian mysteries as, as a salvation theme that you get in St. Paul and, 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 and uh, the early Christian writers. So some of the common threads to all wisdom, tradition, and mystery cults. First, they're esoteric. The knowledge is secret. Mystery, Greek word is mysterion. It's a secret rite or discipline or liturgy through which the, the aspirant unites with the God in a higher state. The mysterion brings you in contact with the God. This act of coming into contact with the God through secret knowledge that's reserved for, for few, is often accompanied by, by a state of exaltation or ecstasy. The knowledge gained is, is not only non-rational, but it's supra-rational. You can't philosophize your way to it. It's the God, it's what St. Augustine would say, uh, we Christians call it grace. It leads you past the limits of, of intellectual investigation. You are brought through secret knowledge into an act that is supra-rational and supra-emotional. Second common thread, there must be an initiation. The aspirant must undergo, undergo preparation either through study or acts of purification, uh, the Greek word is catharsis, to be equipped and worthy to be an initiate, a mistus. A mistus 
is initiated into the mysterion. The uninitiated cannot be trusted with the secret knowledge. So if you, if you went to Kumai near Naples to ask a question of the oracle there, the Sibyl, you walked into the cave and over a period of two or three nights fasting, fasting and purifying before you could come into the presence of the Sibyl and ask your question. At Belfi, the same sort of thing. And power, through initiation, the aspirin is rendered more powerful and more in tune with the universe. So you, you prepare yourself to receive the secret knowledge. You, you perform the discipline or rite. You reenact it. Um, and through the reenactment, you are granted, if, if some power, and salvation cults may be salvation. So for instance, the Roman Catholic Mass, the beginning of it was called the Mass of the Catechumens. This is where epistles were read. This is where the gospel was read. This is where the sermon was given, all of which is instruction to the catechumens, the initiates, who were not yet, until they were baptized, admitted into the secret reenactment, which was the sacrificial part of the Mass. And the, the point at which there is the reenactment of the Last Supper and bread and wine is turned into uh, the body of Christ and, and eaten in a, a Eucharist, a Thanksgiving, consumed so that now the full initiate can receive the God within themselves and, and if you will, be rendered greater and more powerful. So the, the Roman Catholic Mass, in, in effect, is a uh, schematic of these threads that I'm describing here. All the eclectic and syncretic interests of Renaissance humanism, that is, Neoplatonism, Hermeticism, Gnosticism, Kabbalah, Sufism in the, in, in the Islamic tradition, and various strains of Christian mysticism were heavily influenced by mystery cults and wis wisdom traditions. So as our humanists learned ancient languages, they thought they were plugging back into the grand uh, hidden ancient tradition the ancient theology that, that underlined and underscored the full understanding of the universe. So, wisdom and text. Before I was stressing the connectedness and the interconnectedness of everything through the action of emanation and return. Once that is the given, once that is the uh, a accepted theory, then, and I put it in bold text here, then everything is text, everything. All things are signs. All things point to their ultimate source, God, the one, the good. As revealed text requires exegesis, in other words, as people read the Bible, Torah, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and say, well, you don't just read it naive, naively, 
you you read the book of Solomon and and then you you have to properly know how to read it to understand the Im implicit revelation and requires an exegesis, a translation, a deeper explanation, so does the universe. Everything requires exegesis. Everything is grist for the mill. Everything is text. The natural world has hidden meaning. Ah, we have astrology and alchemy. Number has hidden meaning. Ah, we have numerology. Letters and words have hidden meaning. Text, Kabbalah, in Hebrew. This is what makes Kabbalah so uh, wonderfully powerful. In Hebrew, numbers are represented by letters, and so words have hidden numeric value. So they're both doing numerology and, and, and text criticism simultaneously in Kabbalah. Only initiates are equipped to read the signs properly. No one else can look at this. They just come up with, you know, they're, the, guy, the, the guy in the street corner is Homer Simpson in Moe's Tavern going, duh. The humanist is spending his life learning to read the several languages required to understand every aspect of universal reality. So esoteric teachings meant to explain the relationship between God, the unchanging, eternal, and mysterious, the finite universe. That is what the Kabbalah is doing. Uh, somebody. Oh, I got to send it. Okay. Uh, the Sephirot, which is the image on the right, uh, which actually means, Sephirot actually means emanations. It's the Kabbalistic so called tree of life. Em there are emanations to which God reveals himself and continuously creates both the physical realm and the chain of higher metaphysical realms. So the Kabbalist is studying God revelation as a series of emanations in the world. And it becomes a conceptual paradigm for understanding everything in the universe. And I can't begin this would be nine courses on itself to try to, to make sense of Kabbalah in their terms, but so I'm not gonna to spend too much time with this. So, pantheism, syncretism, esoterica. Uh, a couple of significant figures. Uh, Kuzanos, Nicholas of Kuza, who's actually a German. He's an influential mystical writer. He's suspected of pantheism couple of quotes from him. Uh, he's a marvelous character to read. That's why he, he's also a cardinal in the church. Divinity is in, he, he was a cardinal who was suspected of heresy. <laughs> divinity is in all things in such a way that all things are in divinity. The machine of the world will have its center everywhere, so to speak, and its circumference nowhere, because its circumference and its center are God who is everywhere and nowhere. And then there is uh, the grand uh, student, polymath, brilliant young man of, of Renaissance humanism, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, who dies at the age of 31, unfortunately. Um, why do so many people you want to have live longer. The Mozarts and the Vincenzo Bellinis and the Pico della Mirandolas go early. Not to mention Otis Redding, by the way. Anyhow, uh, he's a brilliant student of Pacino. He's a polymath. He's a philosopher. He's a master of languages, including Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic. With Pacino, he studies Plato and Hermeticism with a, a uh, rabbinical scholar, Aliyah del Medigo. He studies Aristotle as received through the Arabic 
traditions and various Hebrew and Arabic sources, not to mention certain Near Eastern sources. From a letter to Ficino, I quote, divine providence caused certain books to fall into my hands. They are Chaldean books, meaning from what would now be Iraq, of Esdras, of Zoroaster, and of Melchior, oracles of the Magi, the Magi, which contain a brief and dry interpretation of Chaldean philosophy, but full of mystery. He becomes the first and most famous Christian Kabbalist. He is the ultimate syncretic thinker. His worldview is such a synthesis, he actually tries to make a claim that Platonism and Aristotelianism are internally consistent. He says, you just have to dig deeper. Platonism, Neoplatonism, Aristotelianism, Hermeticism, the Kabbalah, they're all about the same thing, he wants to argue. So, natural magic, magic that deals with natural forces. Astrology is heavily studied in the Renaissance. Don't, don't you love this woodcut on the upper right? The, the astrologer striding worlds in touch with the entire universe. Uh, it's considered a science. It was considered on a par with astronomy and meteorology. It attempts to hold natural for to control natural forces or use them to predict human events. A conviction of universal interconnectedness coupled with the belief that there were secret, hidden, esoteric explanations was a fertile ground for all kinds of science and pseudoscience. And I want to point out that some people who were became famous in the scientific tradition as astronomers, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, and Galileo, they were also court astrologers. If we could jump for a moment over to, let's go back to our text, and let's look at the Ficino for it. A moment. I, I don't have a lot of time to look at it in great detail. But if you want your body and spirit to receive power from some member of the cosmos, say from the sun, from a celestial body, seek the things which above all are most solar among metals and germs, still more among plants, and more yet among animals, especially human beings. For surely things which are more similar to you confer more of it. So you can actually receive power from the sun in that next paragraph. Always remember that through a given effect and pursuit of our mind and through the very quality of our spirit, we are easily and quickly exposed to those planets which signify the same affect, quality, and pursuit. Hence, by withdrawal from human affairs, by leisure, solitude, constancy, by theology, the more esoteric philosophy, superstition, magic, agriculture, and by sorrow, we come under the influence of Saturn. Um, down here, the Arabic writers prove that by an application of our spirit to the spirit of the cosmos, achieved by physical science and our affect, Celestial goods pass through our soul and body. This happens down here through our spirit within us, which is a mediator, strengthened by the spirit of the cosmos. They're always comparing the universe to the human individual, the microcosm and the macrocosm, uh, closely aligned. If I go on to the next place, let us by no means ever attempt anything forbidden by holy religion. Okay, let's stick to good magic here. Moreover, in remember, he is a priest. This is the Ficino speaking. Moreover, in performing any work, let us hope for and seek the fruit of the work principally from him who made both the celestials and those things which are contained in the heavens, who gave them their power. Since God created it all, 
since it all somehow emanates from him, how could these things not contain messages? Certainly those wonderful therapies which doctors trained in astrology are able to perform through medicines composed of many things, that is powders, liquids, unguents, electuaries, seem to have in themselves a more probable and obvious explanation than do images. Um, uh, down here, I learned from the Platonists that evil demons are mostly Northern, which even the Hebrew astronomers confess, placing harmful martial demons in the North and propitious and jovial ones in the South. Maybe that's why I like to go to Italy instead of Germany. Um, and then on page three, they, the astrologers, hold that certain words pronounced with a quite strong emotion have great force to aim the effect of images precisely where the emotion and words are directed, spells, if you will. Someone will say, Marsilio is a priest, isn't he? Indeed he is. What business then do priests have with medicine or again with astrology? Another will say, what does a Christian have to do with magic or images? And someone else, unworthy of life, will begrudge life to the heavens. Christ, the giver of life, who commanded his disciples to cure the sick of the whole world, will also enjoin priests to heal, at least with herbs and stones. So Christ would approve of doing astrology. Marsilio is not approving magic and images but recounting them in the course of an interpretation of Plotinus. And my writings make this quite clear if they are read impartially. Nor do I affirm there is a single word about profane magic which depends upon the worship of demons. But I mention natural magic, not black magic, but what they like to call natural magic. And on the last page, from this workshop, the Magi, the first of all, adored the newborn Christ. Why then are you so dreadfully afraid of the name of Magus, a name which is pleasing to the gospel, etc.? Back to our application. So astrology and alchemy for him are continuations of philosophy and theology. Alchemy, uh, traditional alchemy was Turning, you know, turning base metals into gold, that sort of thing. But it played a very key role in the development of modern medicine and chemistry. It contributed to uh, scientific lab techniques, uh, different methodologies, certainly different terminologies. It was heavily influenced uh, by Hermeticism and became very occult when used in applications of uh, analysis of what would purify the soul, which was the desired human purification. And I have one of these astrological slash alchemical charts that they were constantly spawning during the Renaissance. Continuing on the theme of uh, magic and the occult, a, in the late later Renaissance, by the time we get to the early 16th century, you get texts on uh, magic and esoteric alchemy. Uh, for instance, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, a, a German, De Occulta Philosophia, and here's a, a cover from one of them that was printed uh, as after it was translated into English, had a a huge following. There were all these texts and handbooks on, on occultism uh, during the Renaissance. And I mentioned here Paracelsus, not that I really wanted to spend much time on him, but, but because I always love reading his full name, which is Philippus Areolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. And uh, no wonder he had a nickname. He pioneered the use of chemicals and minerals in medicine. Uh, many have said of alchemy that it is for the making of gold and silver. For me, such is not the aim, but to consider only what virtue and power 
may lie in medicines. Uh, remember, medicine up until this point had been largely uh, restricted to bleeding and figuring out the balances of the humors and that sort of thing. Suddenly, laboratory chemistry, because of alchemy, was seen as a potential source of uh, cures and, and restoratives for human health and, and did have a huge effect on development of medicine in the period. The hermetical view that sickness and health depended on the harmony of man and nature, microcosm and macrocosm, uh, required you know, a balance of minerals in the body. There was also uh, ceremonial or ritual magic, lots of grimoires, books of spells. Usually, uh, and these are the things that you know, Hollywood has always tried to uh, exploit. Uh, manuals of black magic for spells, charms, divinations, on instructions how to create talismans and amulets. Uh, I mentioned the uh, Clavicula Salomonis over here on the right, the Key of Solomon. It's an invocation of magical operations to be performed by God, influenced by Kabbalah and, and Arabic alchemists. And, and, and by the way, these these wheels with astrological points along the way um, are very central to Renaissance thought. You'll see it again when, on the next slide when I begin to uh, talk about uh, memory techniques. It's, it's our last slide. Uh, I mention it because the humanists were very devoted to the use and development of, of memory techniques. Not the way the Romans were, who were, wanted it, to use it for rhetorical purposes, making speeches and the like, but because these guys, uh, manuscripts were still, and early books were still very hard to come by, and, and our folks here wanted, since they really believed in the interconnectedness of everything, wanted to uh, be able in terms of memory to keep all the linkages, which were never in one text, cross texts in their mind. Really, they were becoming indexers of knowledge and memory techniques and memory palaces, as they were called in the period, were central to this. Uh, mnemonic devices, were largely built around the method of, of what I here in bold have called loci, places. Method of loci or memory palaces. It's a demonic device that uses visualizations of familiar spatial environments in order to enhance recall. When desiring to remember a set of items, the subject walks through these lo loci, loci in English, I guess, in their imagination and commits an item to each one by forming an image between the item and any feature of that locus. So Cicero wrote a couple of documents on it, which were highly popular with the humanists and, and the great Roman rhetorician Quintilianus uh, wrote the Instituto Oratoria, which is the grand text and we can turn to it. It's one of the documents that I sent out. Let me go to the quintillion. So here, the achievement of Simonides. Uh, Simonides, a Greek poet, appears to have given rise to the observation that it's an assistance to memory if localities are sharply impressed upon the mind. A, a view the truth of which everyone may realize by practical experiment. For when we return to a place after considerable absence, we not, on, we not merely recognize the place itself, but remember things that we did there and recall the persons whom we met, and even the unuttered thoughts which passed through our minds when we were there before. Thus, as in most cases, art originates in experiment. Um, the next paragraph, some place is chosen 
of the largest possible extent and characterized by the utmost possible variety, such as a spacious house divided into a number of rooms. Everything of note therein is carefully committed to memory in order that the thought may be, enab may be enabled to run through all the details without let or hindrance. And undoubtedly the first task is to secure that there shall be no delay in finding any single detail since an idea which is to lead by association, association to some other idea requires to be fixed in the mind with more than ordinary certitude. So in the Middle Ages, they often use cathedrals, uh, which was the big public meeting place, if you will, of, of medieval towns, and which people would have known by heart. They would have known every, every side altar, every, every stained glass window, every, every, every font. The next step is to distinguish something that has been written down or merely thought of by some particular symbol which will serve to jog the memory. This symbol may have reference to the subject as a whole. It may, for example, be drawn from navigation, warfare, etc. Remember, this is a Roman writing, or it may, on the other hand, be found in some particular word. For even in cases of forgetfulness, one single word will serve to restore the memory. However, let us suppose that the symbol is drawn from nav navigation, as for instance, an anchor or from warfare, as for example, some weapon. These symbols are then arranged as follows. The first thought is placed, as it were, in the forecourt. The second, let us say, in the living room. The remainder are placed in due order all around the impluvium. That's uh, that little, uh, if you will, that little pool in the middle of a Roman house. And entrusted not merely to bedrooms, and, and that's supposed to be parlors, a typo, but even to the care of statues and the like. This done, as soon as the memory of facts re requires to be revived, all these places are visited in turn, and then the various deposits are demanded from the custodians as the site of each recalls the respective details. Consequently, however, large numbers of these, uh, which it is required to remember, all are linked one to the other like dancers, hand in hand. And there can be no mistake since uh, they, what precedes, what since they that proceeds to what follows, no trouble being required except the preliminary labor of committing the various points to memory. And then on the last page, it will be best to give his ver words verbatim. We must for this purpose employ a number of remarkable places, clearly envisioned and separated by short intervals. The images which we use must be active, sharply cut and distinctive, such as may occur to the mind and strike it with rapidity. And then in the next paragraph, I am far from denying that those devices may be useful for certain purposes. For example, if we have to produce a number of names in the order in which we have heard them. For those who use such age, place the things which have to be remembered in localities which they have previously fixed in memory so that they can get at them in um, succession. So the whole idea is, is to use structured ordering of things that you know utterly and intuitively and then you associate them with the elements that you want to remember. You hang things off these places. You put an idea at the first step of the altar of St. Francis on the side chapel. And you put this other idea on the second step and this other idea on the third step. And then you walk the steps in your mind so that you can do it unconsciously. And just take another five minutes or so, and then I'll open to some questions. In, in the Renaissance, uh, memory and hermeticism became very closely linked. There was a late medieval figure, Ramon Lull, who was a, a wonderful character, a logician, a total polymath, philosopher, mystic. 
He developed a strategy for memorization and analysis based on combinations. And so he built a model of a wheel of rotating concentric circles, which could align to show all possible elements of a subject. And, and this was both for putting together combinations for memory association and combinations for understanding. It was, his idea was picked up by the famous uh, Southern Italian, I don't know what to call him, philosopher, uh, theologian, linguist, occultist, Giordano Bruno, heretic, put to death by the Inquisition in the year 1600, famous for spectacular feats of memory, which for money he would teach to people. He would go to courts. He went to the court in England at one point because there were some people willing to pay a lot of money. And he would do things like memorize entire books of the Old Testament in Hebrew uh, using these complex memory wheels that he had developed. Uh, a sample of one on the right, that statue uh, that I've got a picture of here. If, if you've ever been shopping on a Sunday morning in the uh, Campo dei Fiori in, in Rome, I don't know whether you've noticed the statue that stands at the edge of the market, uh, pointed at the Vatican and glare, glaringly, I should, should have taken a close-up shot of this, uh, at the Vatican, it was uh, some, an anti-clerical society in the 19th century put the statue on a pillar to stare down the Vatican for, for having burned this, this heroic intellectual and symbol of intellectual freedom uh, to death in the year 1600. Uh, but a remarkable figure. And with that, we have a good 10 minutes or so. So what I am going to do, I'm going to stop the share. I am going to unmute people. And there are all your shining faces. Mm -hmm. Now, do <laughs> I realize that this was a uh, significantly strange presentation today. Uh, are there things you want to raise or ask about it? Oops, somebody chatted a... Oh, how were they affected by Columbus's discovery of America? Um, <clears throat> It's interesting. They would have, the, the humanists welcomed it because they saw indigenous peoples as a, um, how shall I put it, as a, a view into natural man. He, I'll get to the question about Bruno in a second. Uh, they, they saw the discovery of, of Native Americans as being an entree to what will later be thought of in, in the next century as uh, the state of nature, emissaries from the state of nature, and, and all sorts of anthropological uh, developments, early enlightenment anthropology was very taken up with people in what they thought of as, as the primitive state. And, and the humanists were, were very early into that sensibility. They wanted to know. And the answer to the question Rick has asked, why was Bruno considered a heretic? Uh, because of this uh, pantheism, sort of this astrological, God has been sending me messages in every way, uh, which led him into some straight 
strange pantheistic corners and the Inquisition just couldn't take it any longer. They, they, they liked him. He was such an oddball. He was held in a kind of, what would you call it? it. Minim, minimum security prison <laughs> for, oh for a great period of time. And, and uh, it was only after a couple of years of his refusing to recant that he was uh, put together. The, the Italian Inquisition, by the way, is not the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition apparently was, was looking for any excuse to send somebody off the deep end, into the deep end of the pool. The, the Italian Inquisition was really much more interested in, in maintaining um, a balance of, of doc, between doctrinal purity and, and it, it's, usually, it's the Italian way of doing anything. Not too much, <laughs> not, <laughs> not too much, not too extreme, um, you know, just, Here. yeah, enough, enough for flavor. Uh, you know, it, it, think of the way, think of the way um, Mussolini's contribution to the Holocaust. The Italian, the Italian regime sent almost no Jews to, to the death camps. It wasn't until Mussolini was overthrown and, and, and Germans took over the administration of Italy that Northern Italians came under threat. Under Mussolini, they were being sent to camps in, um, in Calabria where they were allowed to go shopping in town. And since there were a lot of Jewish doctors from the North sent, sent to the camps, uh, villagers always brought kids for pediatric examinations to the camps. <laughs> and that was sort of the way the Italians did things generally. This is, it's, it's been universally true, I guess, for uh, a long time. Anyhow, boy, boy was that a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> Michelangelo, no, what is it? Modigliani, another one that died young. That's true. Yeah. That is true. And a Jew from Italy. And that is true. Yeah. The, my, the, the first great uh, Roman historian, or hist excuse me, historian of Roman Christianity in the 20th century was a Jew and, and got interested in, in uh, the same topics I got interested in from another angle, interestingly enough. Um, and let's see if we have no more chat room questions. Next week, um, we're going to be looking at theories of human nature. And so, Read the, you should be very entertained by the, um, the documents in question, the, the Chino, uh, excuse me, the uh, Pico and the Machiavelli. And, and then I want to look at uh, Renaissance uh, portraiture. There's a document on the life of Leonardo that's also worth uh, looking at, but not so much as uh, a theory of human nature as an example of a humanist life in, the, in its most extreme form. But that's what we'll be taking a look at it. So there'll be more artwork. This was the week of uh, syncretic <laughs> ideas and eclectic ideas. So with that, if there are no, we have, oh, we have a whole five minutes if we want to uh, keep going. I thought, 
I thought Professor Phelps there would come up with a question. Well, <laughs> I, I do have a comment. Uh, you know, Lou, that uh, by the 18th century, when masonry, speculative masonry was just getting started, the use of memory palaces were considered fundamental to all the memorization of the principles and the ritual uh, that had to be done. So there's a tradition in masonry of employing that technique. Of course, it's been revised. It's not quite the same thing as going through the cathedral or the palace. <laughs> next, next time I do this class, I'll put a fifth session on masonry and you get to be the guest speaker. I love it. <laughs> do you know, do you know the, the, the symbology of masonry is, is all uh, hermetic too, isn't it? Yes, it's coming straight from the Renaissance. Exactly. I mean, from their view of... It's the big uh, eye and the pyramids and... The, right. I love it. <laughs> Who are you? Do, you? do you wear those funny aprons? Well, yes, it's required. <laughs> <laughs> and white gloves, too. <laughs> all, right, all right, gang. Um, next week? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Take care. Thanks everybody. very much. Excellent. Bye-bye. Thank you.